Well, welcome to the first video for the channel hydraulics module within civil hydraulics. Uh, this video will be presented in three parts and it provides an overview of the topic of, of civil hydraulics. The first part will deal with the applications of civil hydraulics um, in, by civil engineers. The second part deals with some of the, the concepts, the key concepts that underpin uh, channel hydraulic theory and the third part will deal with um, some of the key principles. So in this first part, we'll talk about how channel hydraulics is used by civil engineers. And in particular, what might we want to know about flow in a channel and, and why is this important? This is an irrigation supply channel and the civil engineer that designed this supply channel uh, needed to apply channel hydraulics to work out the, the size and the shape of the channel in order to supply enough water to the irrigation district. Um, and that needed to be, in, um, can, those dimensions and the size needed to be um, designed with some consideration of the gradient of the channel within this landscape and the roughness of the channel created by these grassy banks. Here's a couple of other irrigation supply channels, much larger canals, uh, snaking across this landscape. And it's interesting to ask, wh why are the, the canals so sinuous? surely it would be much cheaper to design uh, straight um, supply channels. And, and the answer is quite a simple one. It relates to the, the, um, the, the hydraulics of these channels. Here's another designed, constructed um, uh, river channel. And in this case, it's a diversion channel. It diverts the Moor River around the Yalorn coal mine. So the Yalorn coal mine could expand over what was the original natural uh, alignment of the watercourse. And this diversion has two parts. It's got this low flow sinuous channel and that sits within a much larger floodway. And both the low flow channel and the floodway needed to be designed um, so they had sufficient capacity to carry the low flow and the flood floodwaters. Unfortunately, this particular engineering project didn't fare so well when there was a major flood um, throughout Gippsland in 2012. But first, fears tonight that the state's power supplies could be under threat after the Morwell River broke its banks, sending floodwaters rushing into the Yalorn Open Cut Mine. The crisis comes as towns further east battle rising rivers with the army called in to help at Lake's entrance. But we begin our coverage at the Yalorn Power Station, which supplies a significant percentage of the state's electricity. What was supposed to be a trickle turned into a torrent. A diverted section of the Morwell River bursting its banks, sending water gushing through a tunnel. In ruins, the conveyor system that transports coal to the power station and water filling the open-cut mine that provides more than 20% of the state's power. Dave Murphy retired two days ago after about 20 years at Yalorn. He's never seen anything like this. Looks bad, this one, though. I think they'll have to close it for a while. With the open-cut mine now looking more like a lake, Getting the coal out is the big concern. But the issue for us really is not dealing with that water right now. We're really um, focusing on the, the transport of the coal from the coal face um, to the power station. Uh, initially it'll look like uh, trucks, um, so basically using diggers to mine the coal. Only one of the four generators continues to operate and that's running at less than half normal capacity. Still, the state government's not concerned about Victoria's power supply. Victorians can have confidence that uh, sufficient electricity is being generated to keep both the lights and the heaters on, which is very important at this time of year. The opposition isn't so optimistic. Will he still be giving that assurance in a week's time if we find that the impact of the floods on the open cut mine have not been resolved by then? This is not an overnight problem. The enormity of the damage is not lost on locals who fear the power station may be beyond repair. Well, they've been waiting for clean coal. This might be it. It could be. The Greens will be happy. It's not just uh, with large engineering projects in the developed world where we are concerned about um, civil hydraulics. Uh, here's uh, an, ir an irrigation supply channel to a rice paddy field in India, um, which obviously requires some knowledge of open channel flow in order to design the irrigation supply channel. And the Romans um, were masters of open channel hydraulics. Their aqueducts are still in evidence across Europe or Southern Europe today, um, and it was their ability to be able to design, um, to apply hydraulic theory to design these aqueducts 
and their civil engineering uh, skills in constructing them that really enabled them to establish some very uh, large and prosperous municipal centres uh, across Europe. And here's a, a, also another view of one of those aqueducts, a remarkable um, engineering feat given the, uh, the equipment they had at the time. Um, and, and, the, and the Romans you know, knew how to work out how big they should be, what the, what the gradient should be um, uh, to supply enough water to, the, to their cities. And waterways are not just used to, to supply water, to transport water, they're also used to transport good. This is a, a, a channel or canal which is used for, for navigation um, by, by barges. And this uh, path where the bike rider is, is actually a towpath. And in former times, uh, horses or mules would have pulled um, ropes which would have towed the, uh, the barges along that channel to transport goods. And those channels um, could crisscross uh, many of uh, the countries in Europe, England, France, um, Germany, um, to, to transport goods throughout the, uh, the country. And in some cases, and this is an example, the irrigation canals will actually have to cross uh, uh, natural waterways and have to be constructed within an elevated aqueduct. And in urban areas, hydraulics is also important. Uh, in this case, uh, in, in relation to flood, flood management, we know that uh, urban areas generally increase runoff from rainfall. The impervious surface produces more, more runoff. And so we have very fl flashy and very peaky um, high volume floods. And so civil engineers need to apply channel hydraulics to work out how big um, urban waterways should be to carry those floods. Culverts can also um, require application of open channel hydraulics um, in cases where they're not entirely full. They're effectively open channels, although one might look at them and think they're a pipe. And if you don't get the hydraulics right, this is what happens. You get uh, the pipe can back up, fill, fill up, and the flow will pass around the culvert uh, and create erosion uh, causing um, a, you know, a lot of damage and a lot of cost in terms of repairs. Sewers can also be examples where uh, channel hydraulics needs to be applied. And even uh, aesthetic features um, can, can require some channel hydraulics. This is a, a water feature at Ground Zero in New York. And of course, civil engineers working on flood problems need to apply open channel hydraulics. This is a picture of a flood down Swanson Street in Melbourne in 1973, where the whole road has effectively become an open channel. But let's return now to the Channel 10 news story we were looking at before dealing with the Channel, the, um, the Alorn coal mine accident, um, but further to the east in Bansdale during that same flood event. Today though, the focus was on Bansdale. Here's how the town coped with its flood crisis. Lapping at the back door, the swollen Mitchell River threatens to rise even further. It's already swallowed the footy oval, the club rooms barely visible above the waterline. The whole area is just a wash and there's been hay bales and apples and there was a caravan floating down last night. Since Monday morning, many parts of Gippsland have received a month's rainfall. We've got around 100 properties that are isolated by floodwaters. Bansdale is the latest town to come under threat. Some of these houses may have water in them, but most have been spared. But if the river rises just a few more centimetres, all of these homes will be inundated. And that's the challenge for civil engineers working in hydraulics, to be able to predict uh, elevations of floodwaters uh, to an accuracy of centimetres, because it's centimetres that matter in terms of um, inundation of property. Well, that's the end of this first part in the introduction to channel hydraulics. You'll find the next part will deal with some of the concepts um, that are critical to, to channel hydraulic theory.